The National Bureau of Asian Research presents an audio podcast of the April 7, 2011, roundtable discussion on U.S. defense strategy in the Asia-Pacific, with featured guest Admiral Thomas Fargo. To listen to more podcasts of MBR events, please visit our website at www.mbr.org. Well, I'm going to turn it over to the Admiral, but uh, before we go into substance, I'm going to ask him how a guy with glasses gets to be a four-star. <laughs> Are you from a long tradition of, of Navy families? And as a submariner, I would have made the same mistake. <laughs> how do you get from the beginning of that career to commanding everything in the Pacific? Man, it was a... Uh, you know, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but uh, I grew up in a Navy family. My father was a naval aviator, and my mother was a, a Navy nurse in, in World War II and served throughout the Pacific. I uh, actually supported the Marines eventually on Guadalcanal, uh, and not in the early days, but in the, in the latter days of Guadalcanal. Uh, my grandfather was a naval aviator also. He was naval aviators. Uh, when you get your wings, they give you a number, and he was naval aviator number 1599. So... Uh, not quite as far back as the Wright brothers, but, <laughs> but, Darn, but close. <laughs> but close. And so, uh, uh, you know, I, my parents, uh, you know, watching them move from you know, San Diego to Washington, D.C., to Japan, uh, it was pretty clear to me that, that they very much enjoyed this lifestyle and, and the, the friends that they met and the, the camaraderie of, uh, of the Navy. And uh, so I... Uh, you know, I was a volunteer, uh, but my father, being a, a planner, I mean, he he never left anything uh, uh, to chance. So one day uh, he shoved this application in front of me, and I said, "What's that?" And he said, "That's your application to the United States Naval Academy. Sign here." <laughs> so I, I knew where you were going. <laughs> I, I said, uh, "I said, uh, don't I have to write a, you know, an essay, you know, why I want to be in the Navy or something like that." And he said, "You already have. Just sign." <laughs> So, so that's uh, so that's kind of how it started, and I, and I I wanted to be there, and I was telling the senator, uh, I went down to take the, the flight physical, and uh, the guy said, read the chart, and I read the chart, and he said, now do it without squinting, and we eventually got to the point uh, where we decided that I couldn't read it without squinting, and so he uh, he stamped it, you know, not qualified to to fly, and so I had to think about about something else, and of course this was. Uh, this was 1970, and we were we were right, uh, you know, in the uh, in the middle of the Cold War, you know, really. And I, I looked around, and and it, it uh, seemed to me that that a big part of uh, of the Navy in the future was going to be the submarine force. And uh, you know, we were moving into what I call the hunt for Red October era uh, with uh, the Soviet Union when. You know, their their nuclear missiles were at sea, and, and that was the largest threat to our our country and our submarine force was uh, was probably the most uh, potent uh, uh, system to counter uh, that that capability. So, uh, so I went to the submarine force and uh, was very fortunate to work for a lot of uh, great folks uh, growing up. One of which I saw last night, Tom Hayward, you know, who was at the session at the university. Club and uh, you know between uh, uh, a lot of great guidance and a little bit of luck uh, ended up as the Pacific Fleet commander and then uh, the PACOM commander out in Honolulu. So that's kind of how I got here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that from what Chris has given, you know, you uh, only fairly recently returned from your first trip to China in quite a long time, probably since you had that command. What's the difference? What's the challenge? What's going on? Well, you know, it is a, it's almost better going back after a, a five-year gap because it gives you a, a much better sense of the kind of progress uh, that's been made, the change, you know, the, uh, the dynamics of, of the problem. I, I'd made a number of trips uh, when I was the... Uh, Pacific Fleet Commander and the and the Pacific Commander, 
uh, you know, got to uh, to Qingdao, Beijing a couple times, Shanghai, um, uh, out uh, out in the west to Chengdu as well as as Hong Kong and uh, Nanjing and Ningbo. Just uh, you know, in, in the various trips, I'm very fortunate because, as you know, uh, our military commanders right now, uh, with the military to military relationship, uh, kind of just getting back. Uh, you know, up to speed again. I haven't had that same opportunity, uh, but the uh, the change was uh, uh, was very evident, uh, especially when you when you looked at the PLA, uh, the the maturity uh, and and I would say the sophistication of the officer corps. I thought uh, had uh, had improved dramatically. You know, six seven years ago when you would go. Have a conversation, or what you hoped was a conversation, with your counterpart in China. Uh, you know, they read a set of talking points, and, and sometimes nonstop, as you all know, for 20 or 30 minutes at, at length. And it was very difficult to to break in uh, to the the dialogue. Uh, this time, I I would tell you that the, the conversations were what you hoped they would be. I mean, it was a it was a discussion and an exchange, uh, and the uh, the officers that uh, you know we were uh, engaging uh, clearly had a, a much broader sense of the international community, uh, and that was at kind of the, the headquarters level. The senior folks, when you went out in the field uh, to the sixth division, one of the uh, army divisions in the vicinity of Beijing, uh, you could have been visiting an American unit from a standpoint of the manner in which I was uh, uh, accommodated, so to speak. Uh, not from a standpoint of the, of the equipment. Uh, the equipment and the technology, at least what, what we saw, was still, you know, decades behind our own uh, technology. Like I said, at least what, uh, what we got a, a peek at. Uh, but in, in terms of the of the division commander's ability to brief you and talk to you about his concerns. When you asked him a question, a typical question that, that you might get in Washington, D.C., you know, what are, what are your readiness shortfalls? You know, what, uh, what is not funded adequately? Uh, you know, six years ago, you'd have gotten an answer that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the party funds our unit at precisely what we need at every turn uh, along the, the path. Uh, but it wasn't that way this time. He, he ticked off uh, three gaps he had in, in funding and capability uh, you know, in a very precise and art, articulate manner. And then, and then we went and had uh, lunch with the troops, uh, with the enlisted troops, which is, uh, is something that you never... Uh, you never really got a chance to engage the PLA enlisted folks at any level uh, before. Now, granted, this was probably a a crack unit. I mean, uh, not every Chinese army soldier is six one, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, you know the differences their uh, their understanding of uh, of uh, you know what. Uh, uh, what constitutes uh, readiness, uh, their understanding of the importance of a, of a volunteer force and, uh, and very well trained and uh, educated enlisted uh, NCOs and uh, the role of the non-commissioned officer in an effective organization, uh, that was a big change. Readiness for what? Uh, um, obviously, we have seen a very you know, assertive China uh, in the seas and disputes over small islands and uh, mm -hmm. natural resources, and much of the usual rhetoric about uh, uh, Taiwan. Um, do you do you have any uh, significant insight into what the overall long and medium term strategy of the Republic of uh, the People's Republic is? Well, I think that's kind of the $64,000 question. You know, what is, uh, what is the intent of all this? It's, I mean, it's very clear that they're building a, uh, a military that uh, they believe is commensurate with uh, great power status. I mean, I think, I think that's probably 
uniformly accepted now. And if you saw the most recent budgets that they have come out with, uh, they have have probably adjusted their investment into the maritime forces, naval forces, and of course the uh, the, the missile forces. Uh, uh, they call it the second artillery, I, I believe. Uh, so they're. Uh, in my view, uh, and this is my view, they clearly recognize that uh, if they're going to continue to grow and expand, uh, that uh, the the movement of, of raw materials and resources into China uh, via what you would call the sea lines of communications uh, is going to be critical to them. And so uh, they're going to build, I believe, maritime capability that they, they feel can uh, defend their interests in that regard. Now, the the rocket forces, of course, are they're a, a different story. I mean, they they project uh, you know well out past the first island chain and the second island chain, and uh, and they they have uh, uh, an offensive power projection capability that uh, that you have to wonder uh, what uh, you know the end objective of that capability really is. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think time will, will tell. Uh, it's, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to know precisely how they will use this capability. They would tell you it's, uh, it's all uh, defensive uh, in nature, uh, but it does make their neighbors nervous, as, uh, as you brought up, Senator. What, uh, you know, what we uh, know is the new assertiveness has also led to what you might call the new clumsiness. And that is that uh, whereas over the years uh, this kind of soft power strategy, the peaceful rise of China, uh, has given way to what you might almost call diplomatic mistakes over the last year with their position with respect to uh, the sinking of the Chonan, uh, their position with respect to the attack on uh, uh, the South Korean island at uh, Waipido, uh, their uh, very vocal position in terms of the, of the South China Sea and, and the areas that uh, obviously that their neighbors operate in on a regular basis. So uh, this, uh, this new clumsiness has, has led to a degree of concern in the region as to you know, what is the ultimate intent. Has that, uh, well, as we call it, new clumsiness, uh, in, in, in your view, with a representative of our most important ally sitting right, the, uh, right beside you here, has it changed our relationships uh, with the other, with, uh, with our allies and friends in the immediate area of China? Well, I think those relationships uh, have, have always been strong. Uh, you know, when I look around the region, of course, our relationship with uh, uh, Japan is, is second to none. Uh, it is, uh, you know, over the last 50 years, we've built a, a tremendously close relationship, uh, uh, you know, from really from the, from the bottom up, uh, you know, the, uh, the Japanese uh, maritime self-defense forces, the Japanese self-defense forces, as well as the nation-to-nation -nation relationship, and, and you're seeing that in play right now as, uh, as we try to support our good friend and ally. And, and the, re the relationships, uh, alliance relationships with uh, Korea, with South Korea, uh, Thailand, uh, Australia, and the Philippines are, are very good. The relationship with Singapore uh, has been absolutely rock solid for the last 15 years. Uh, and uh, and new countries, uh, uh, such as, uh, I don't mean new in, in terms of, uh, of their existence, I mean new in terms of their kind of emergence on the world scene, like Indonesia and India, have become, uh, uh, you know, good friends and, and partners in the region. So, so I don't think, I don't think it... matter about that dynamic with India. There's a great counterpart. That. How has that changed even since you've left the Navy? Well, I, I think it's uh, I think it's much stronger. I mean, there was, uh, you know, I, I made my first visit to India in 1993, and of course there was a lot of, of suspicion on both sides of the table, uh, and 
and it just not a lot of a lot of trust. I mean, the Indians had voted with the Soviet Union in terms of their their military capability and and, and hardware uh, early on, and 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 of course, uh, uh, you know, our relationship with them had kind of you know run the cycle between uh, uh, you know embracing each other and then sanctions and back and forth largely because of the of the nuclear program. I think uh, that relationship's on a much more stable footing right now. Uh, on a military to military level, uh, we operate uh, together and exercise together uh, very frequently. Uh, we do uh, air to air uh, operations with uh, their uh, tactical aircraft and our aircraft on a, on a regular basis, and, and we participate in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief efforts like the tsunami relief effort 2004. Uh, in a very closely coordinated manner. So uh, that relationship, I, I think, is, uh, uh, is uh, much improved, and I think all of the vectors are in the right direction. Were you Pacific Commander in 2004? Yes, I was. Yeah. Oh, God. Can you sort of compare that? Tell us what the Navy's function was there and whether that has any lessons for the present disaster in Japan or what's happening in that connection. Well, I think it does. You know, this was, uh, uh, as you remember, the tsunami in uh, in Indonesia was was similar to Japan in that it was it was right off the coast, you know, ten miles. The, the earthquake was ten miles or so off the coast, and of course, uh, when that happens, uh, there is uh, there is no time uh, to evacuate. Uh, the the tidal wave or a wall of water really that constitutes the the tsunami hits immediately and. Uh, there's no chance to to evacuate, and so the loss of life is absolutely devastating. And of course, in between Indonesia and Thailand and Sri Lanka, uh, some 250,000 lives were lost in that particular tsunami. I mean, you put that in context with uh, with almost anything we've seen in our lifetime, it's uh, it's really tremendously dramatic. Uh, but you know, these relationships that we were talking about had been in place. I had. I've been the Pacific Fleet Commander for three years, and then uh, at that point in time, the Pacific Commander for uh, for over two years. So uh, the personal relationships that, that I'd built with the military commanders in the region were uh, were really very robust, and on a on a uh, professional level, and as I said, and a personal level. So that morning, I remember it was Sunday morning. Uh, the first call I got was from Peter Cosgrove, the head of the Australian Defense Forces, and that was a key call because uh, they had great insight into Indonesia, and they were going to be uh, probably our leading partner in the disaster relief effort. But that was quickly followed with a series of, of calls with uh, the Malaysian Chief of Defense, the Thai Chief of Defense, obviously the U.S. Ambassador uh, to Indonesia, uh, and then ultimately to uh, General Su, uh, Sutarto, who was the uh, Indonesian uh, senior military officer. Uh, what, that, what that provided for us uh, was the ability to kind of cut through the bureaucratic uh, red tape and gain access uh, to key locations uh, where we could provide support, such as uh, Singapore at uh, Changi, uh, the airfield at Butterworth in Malaysia that was right across from Aceh and in, in Sumatra. So uh, we were able to, to move uh, with much greater speed and, and alacrity than we would have been otherwise if we had to go through the normal uh, approval circuit to, to gain access. Uh, in Japan, uh, it's a little different. You know, since we've had you know, a very long-standing relationship and, and we operate from joint bases with uh, the Japanese in places like Yokota, uh, Yokosuka, Misawa, uh, all, you know, in, in pretty close proximity to Sendai. Uh, we already had infrastructure in place uh, that we could, uh, we could move uh, supplies into the area to conduct search and rescue operations to, uh, to partner uh, you know, absolutely in support of the Japanese self-defense forces. So, so it's a little different from that standpoint. But almost, almost every operation of this nature is going to require some uh, key components right off the bat. And 
Uh, obviously, the, we talked about the search and rescue piece to make sure that you've saved every life that you possibly can. Uh, the second is is uh, is getting uh, water and food to uh, the people that are going to be displaced from from shelter, and those are large numbers. And of course, we're in in, in both situations. Uh, uh, and then uh, you have to you have to worry about. Uh, the, the health and, and medical aspects of uh, of the area that was especially an especially large concern in a in a place like Aceh where there wasn't a lot of infrastructure anyway and so the the principal difference was was how you came at the problem uh, in the in the the Boxer Day tsunami uh, we immediately got uh, the aircraft carrier underway from Hong Kong and sent that uh, south through the uh, through the strait to the tip of Sumatra as well as uh, amphibious shipping because we recognized since there weren't going to be airfields uh, that had any uh, significant size or, or capacity, we were going to have to do an awful lot of this support effort uh, from the sea, you know, from the, the large decks of an aircraft carrier or, or amphibious ships. And, the, and, of course, our allies did the same thing. We had some 15 navies involved uh, Singapore sent, uh, uh, you know, landing ships that had both amphibious uh, craft, uh, you know, and helicopters that could provide lift. Helicopters end up being probably the most valuable asset, uh, whether you're in Japan or, or Indonesia, because you have to be able to get to these places that have essentially been cut off from any other form of communications. I'll take a pause now. Anybody uh, have uh, uh, any questions here? Great. Admiral Fargo, I wanted to ask you to reflect back on your 35 years of service, and I understand you had like six tours of duty in Washington, D.C., <laughs> yeah. as well as five commands. And I'm just curious, what was the most interesting chapter, the most challenging chapter? Was it with a command, or was it your work in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> <laughs> I used to used to say I I had six tours in Washington and and you go to Washington D.C. Uh, to serve because uh, that hopefully will provide you an opportunity to get back to the fleet. You know, and, and most of the, most of my tours I went to Washington and ordered myself back to the fleet. Which is a convenient convenient way to to do it. Uh, you know, I was uh, I was you know, very blessed. I, I I went to Washington as a young lieutenant and. Of course, uh, an awful lot of my friends during that period of time were, uh, that I that I met uh, that were working the same hours I was, which meant until 7:30 at night, were up on Capitol Hill, and they were working until 7:30 at night. So, when you when you met for a uh, for a drink after work, it was generally at nine o'clock or something like that, because that's just the way Washington was. But it was a it was a great education, you know, in terms of uh, of uh, of how the uh, the military and uh, uh, and the Congress and uh, and a and a government works at a at a young age. And I came back because, I, frankly, I I thought it was exciting. And and you learned a a, a couple of things. And that was that uh, if you were going to be able to make a difference uh, long term in the Navy, then you had to spend some time in Washington to understand you know those those mechanisms. Yeah. Because because frankly, uh, Washington. Uh, does three things uh, that are very important to you when you're a fleet commander. One is it sets policy. Two, it provides you a budget, and, and three, it gives you people. Uh, and those are the those are the three functions that that come out of the, the Pentagon, which is policy, uh, budget, and uh, and the personnel policies and people. So, uh, so I thought it was essential. But of course, uh, I mean the the thrill. Uh, was was going back and and operating a, a ship at sea and a, of course I had the great good fortune to command uh, a submarine as I said during the, the Cold War and it, and it really was uh, uh, it was uh, what I call a, a heart in the throat experience I mean these were the these were the heady days of the of the Cold War as I said the hunt for Red October era and you uh, uh, it was uh, flat exciting and that's why. Uh, you prepared as, as hard as you did. You trained as uh, as often as you did, and you uh, uh, and you came back for more because uh, you were working with with very high quality people, 
uh, you were doing something that you felt was uh, uh, tremendously rewarding uh, and Im important, and uh, that you were making a, a contribution. So, uh, so we stuck around. You know, in my case, for for 35 years. Uh, in terms of, if I had to, if I had to say the most uh, unusual uh, and interesting tour I had was probably when I commanded the. Uh, U.S. Naval Forces in the Middle East in the Fifth Fleet, and I lived in Bahrain. Uh, of course, Bahrain's in the news, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot today. But, uh, you know, I've lived in Japan, and I enjoyed Japan, uh, you know, both as a, as a young kid in high school and later on in the Navy. Uh, but, you know, the opportunity to, to be immersed, you know, for two years in a completely different culture uh, was a fabulous uh, experience and, and opportunity. And, uh, and you learned a great deal about uh, about uh, about people and um, and uh, and how they uh, and how they see the world and, and you, you find in most cases that uh, uh, that there's a, there's a great deal of alignment uh, and there certainly uh, was in my time there in Bahrain. Uh, the toughest problem I ever dealt with, uh, without a doubt, uh, was the uh, the sinking of the Hime Maru. When I was the Pacific Fleet commander, and uh, when we unfortunately had a had a tragedy where a submarine uh, surfaced underneath the Japanese training ship, and and nine lives were were lost. Uh, almost ten years uh, uh, ten years ago, I think in, in February, if I have it uh, correct. Uh, and that's a that's a separate story on, on its own. But uh, uh, the effort. Uh, the effort to deal with that appropriately was uh, uh, was really very complex, and that and I'll I'll give you kind of the bottom line, and we can talk about it offline later. But but the lesson that I learned was that, uh, and what we tried to do uh, was what I call the case for transparency, and and that is that if you don't, uh, in this particular case, we did a uh, an open to the press court of inquiry. We put a Japanese naval officer on the court, and we uh, and we uh, made it all available to the public. And what I learned over over a career was that if you didn't build that kind of transparency, you would never get past the event. And uh, we learned that our whole life. If you look at things like uh, uh, Watergate, um, if you look at uh, in, the, in the Navy, tail hook uh, was an example where. Uh, people just never felt that they understood uh, the whole the whole story. And uh, when uh, if you don't build uh, that degree of transparency, so that everybody uh, believes that they know essentially all that there is that can be known about a, a tragedy or a crisis, uh, then you can't get past it. And that was the lesson. Tom, let me uh, ask a question. I know that's kind of behind everybody's concern about Asia today and it has to do with China. I mean, the rise of China is a historic, momentous uh, phenomenon. Um, in fact, many argue it's just simply China, given its size uh, and historic role, is simply returning to what it was except for a few hundred bad years um, as the center of uh, world commerce and production and population and all this stuff. Um, the question though is, of course, in this rise of China is the unpredictability of its political system. Um, and so this particular rise of China in a context in which democracy has swept so much of the Asia Pacific, the existing power, uh, dominant power of the United States is so democratic and free. And in this environment, you get, as you've indicated, um, uh, there's a lot of, from the last 18 months particularly, of Chinese behavior, suspicion, concern, lack of transparency. You know, how do those guys, how are they making their decisions? What do they really want with this stuff? How do we interpret it? Because the system is opaque um, and so difficult to understand. Is there something about this rise and the nature of it about China that in particular Obviously, it's a driving force behind the closeness of many of our new relationships in Asia. But is there something about this that um, makes it particularly 
harder or more difficult or are the opportunities greater for Pacific Command? As a commander sits out there and deals with this phenomenon, I mean, the concrete military threat that's growing to the ships we have and so on at the same time, it's a big complicated thing. China is just permeates everything, mm -hmm. every thought. Yeah. Where do you want to start? Well, let me talk about the transparency. You know, it, it is amazing. It, it, so it's, it's 2011 now. Uh, my last visit to, to China before I retired was 2005, I guess, or late 2004. And I'm sitting there um, getting dressed, watching CNN, the typical 7 o'clock, and I'm putting my tie up, and uh, uh, I'm watching a CNN report, and they're talking about a a human rights uh, issue uh, in Australia. And there's the Chinese ambassador to Australia. And all of a sudden, the TV went blank. That, you know, I kind of <laughs> knocked it on the corner, looked at the plug, and, and I changed the channel. And there's something on the other channel, and turned, changed it back. And, and uh, 60 seconds later, TV, TV came back on. And I go, Am, am I really seeing this? I mean, they just censored. <laughs> they just censored that report, and I'm in a I'm in a four star hotel, and you know, and it's it's 20:05. I said it just it's hard to believe, and in the context of uh, that we live in today, that 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 can happen, and of course, it still happens. Uh, the uh, so you know you you would hope that uh, that that there will be a demand. That will will change that, uh, and and I think there will, you know, to some uh, very significant extent. In terms of how you deal with the complexity of, of this problem, you know, I, I think you can uh, you can try to dissect it and and figure out uh, step B, C, and D and predict what's actually going to happen. But I think from the from the military commanders and the national security standpoint. Uh, what you what you recognize is whether it's uh, whether it's China or Russia or India India or put any name on it uh, the United States can't put itself in a position where they cede uh, uh, technological superiority or the capability to deal with any entity that that's out there so uh, I don't I don't spend a lot of time you know worrying exactly how this is going to come out. What, what I believe to be true is that you uh, you have a responsibility to maintain, you know, a certain level of capability to deal with whatever um, uh, is potentially uh, going to come your way. And uh, so, uh, you know, when you when you start to say I'm, we're building capability to deal with China, I I think I think that's probably. Uh, you probably need to deal with it in a much broader sense than that because nobody's crystal ball is clear 20 years out. I mean, we, we prove that day in, uh, day in, day out, year in, year out. So, Sometimes 20 days out. Yeah, 20 <laughs> days out. <on. laughs> yeah, I don't know why I'm having dinner tonight. You know, uh, the, uh, so, so you. Uh, I'm in charge of so, that. Either. So, that's our, that's our obligation is to to maintain uh, that capability uh, to advance uh, from a technical standpoint so that we can, uh, we can deal uh, with whatever may be the situation 20 years from now uh, uh, and in a, in a manner that will uh, protect the security and the interests of our country. Walt? Uh, one area you haven't touched on, Admiral, is Korea. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the military perception of risks and hopes. <coughs> South Korea, North Korea, right relations, North Korea, China, change in leadership in North Korea, nuclear threat. Yeah, you know, the, the Korea piece is, uh, is uh, one of the great constants in my career. Uh, you can always... Uh, Predict that you will not be able to predict what North Korea will do next. Uh, it's uh, it has been, like I said, it, it has been uh, pretty pretty steady. Uh, you know, starting with the foundation, uh, we've uh, 
you know, we always obviously have a very strong uh, alliance relationship there. Uh, but it's changed, you know, dramatically probably over the last 10 years, and will so in the next in the next 10 years. Uh, it, you know, we used to have a, a, a much larger presence on uh, the Korean Peninsula, and frankly, uh, if you'd asked us 15 years ago uh, who would be doing the majority of the fighting if there was another conflict on the peninsula, it would have been the United States and, uh, to a lesser extent, the United Nations uh, Command. Uh, I think that's changed uh, dramatically. The, the the quality of the North Korean, uh, of the South Korean military is much higher. They fly very high performance uh, aircraft. Uh, they have uh, they have a very capable uh, ground uh, defense force. It's not as large as the one million North Korean uh, end strength army, uh, but it's. Uh, hugely proficient, and as you know, uh, we're on a path to actually transfer command uh, from what's always been a, a U.S. command there in the Combined Forces Command on the peninsula uh, to uh, a Korean-led Combined Forces Command, and uh, that's very appropriate. Uh, that that path has been slowed down, or that transition date has been moved to the right. Uh, by two or three years, based on the most recent uh, North Korean actions, but uh, but I believe that that it that will happen and and should happen because uh, frankly the uh, the relationship uh, has matured to that point and the, the quality of the uh, South Korean the ROC military leadership uh, has changed. Uh, you know, I think the. I think it's hard for me to come to the conclusion that North Korea is going to give up these weapons. Uh, I, you know, we we keep getting uh, taken down that path to some significant extent, and we raise these these hopes, and uh, and then it uh, it seems to slip back into its current posture uh, once again. I I just think that you know. Uh, you know, job one for the uh, Kim family is uh, to uh, uh, to still have a job <laughs> for the Kim family, uh, and and frankly, I, I think they think that uh, the uh, at least either the presence or the illusion that they have nuclear weapons uh, is uh, important to that. So, uh, you know, you would hope uh, that some. Uh, uh, some sanity would would reign, and that uh, that uh, the Kim family would would recognize that uh, they could uh, they could open their society and uh, embrace the, their neighbors uh, for the sake of the prosperity of their people. Uh, but my view is that they see that as the uh, slippery slope to their demise. And that's unfortunate, but that's where we're we're at. We have a question. Here. Go ahead. I, I'd like to ask you a question also with Council General Oda. With this response um, in Japan, what impact will this have on the Japan US Security Alliance? Uh, also, do you see that this might influence changing Article 9 uh, when we are so close? working together that within Japan that we might work very closely together in other parts of Asia, which would mm -hmm. require changing our... Changing the Constitution, yeah. Well, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think this is a is and has been an enduring relationship. And, uh, you know, we, we have seen uh, bumps along the road and, and certainly the, you know, the issue over the FATEMA replacement facility and in Okinawa is is one of those, and uh, and these things, you know, sometimes get harder rather than easier. But we always manage to uh, to work our way through through them, and I believe we, we certainly will in this particular case. Uh, you know, I think the relationship is fundamentally strong, and and of course, what we've just seen over the last two weeks, uh, one validates it and will fortify it. Uh, Moving forward, but even independent of this, I think we we would get through all of those issues because it's just way too important uh, to not move forward uh, 
and and I think that's uh, I think it's if it if there was some pockets where that wasn't understood before this uh, unfortunate tragedy, I think it's probably clearer now. Um, so, you know, that's the U.S.-Japan relationship. You know, uh, Article 9, uh, the Consul General probably understands better than I do uh, what the political uh, possibilities of, of changing that are. I would say even uh, without any change, you're seeing the, uh, the, the Japanese contribute on a much greater level throughout the region. Uh, certainly, they participated in the tsunami relief effort in Indonesia. Uh, they uh, participated in a supporting role uh, in terms of things like refueling our ships in the North Arabian Gulf and Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation uh, Enduring Freedom. Uh, they participate in the counter piracy operations uh, off the coast of, of Somalia. And so, you know, there are mechanisms that have, have allowed them to, to play you know, a more substantive role internationally in, in these kinds of issues, especially the humanitarian assistance disaster relief issues. Richard? Uh, very quickly, I wanted to follow on with Richard's excellent question. Um, Robert Kaplan really recently applied the phrase uh, geography of conflict to the Asia <coughs> Pacific region, and where Rich really spelt out in great detail about some of the sort of military, potential military uh, challenges. I was uh, queried more about uh, sort of the challenges concerning the contested comments, the waterways, seaways, sea lanes. Mm -hmm. And do you see potential um, threats coming from nation state actors in that realm, or do you think they'll be more sort of non-nation state actors? I'm thinking pirates, terrorism, and the like. And, and what do you think will be the balance of the sort of the threat threshold? In the future. Well, it's, it's a key issue, and one of the things we did when we went to uh, China this time is we actually went and visited, uh, uh, as I guess uh, Roy said, we walked into the lion's den of uh, the uh, Chinese equivalent of our National Ocean and Atmospheric Agency, uh, the people that, uh, that uh, govern all of the of the uh, policy with respect to maritime uh, operations. So, you know, one of the things that I was interested in was uh, did the Chinese really get the UN Law of the Sea Convention? Uh, or, uh, you know, did it, we need to lend them some of our lawyers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> and uh, we came away with a clear Conclusion. Hey, we're going to lend them some of our lawyers. <laughs> they, we offered. They. <laughs> the, uh, they understand the law of the sea convention every bit as well as we do. This this isn't a matter of interpretation. This is this is frankly uh, they don't want us operating uh, in uh, any of the areas adjacent to China, and they would like to come up with some. Uh, convention to allow to push us away, and uh, you know this is this is not new. I mean, 20 years ago, the Soviet Union came up with uh, a declaration that everything north of Iceland ought to be uh, what they called an uh, an ASW free zone. You know, uh, submarines will not go north of uh, of Iceland. Well, you know, yeah, you you can't. Uh, you know, the freedom of navigation and freedom of the seas uh, is, uh, is one of those kind of inviolate uh, uh, rights that nations have to ensure their own prosperity. And, uh, you know, the free flow of goods and, and trade uh, just can't be inhibited uh, if you're going to run a global economy. And you can't uh, you can't, if you're the Chinese, X out certain areas and say, uh, uh, well, we call that the East China Sea, so obviously it's ours and uh, you can't operate there. Uh, and going forward, you know, we're going to have to uh, to be particularly resolute uh, on on this issue. I mean, the territorial sea is, is 12 miles, and that's what it means. And uh, we'd be very smart 
in my view, to ratify the law of the sea treaty as as soon as we possibly can. I mean, we've adhered to it uh, from uh, the moment that it was uh, originally signed, but uh, you know, politically, we just haven't gotten it up to the front burner, uh, and we 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 have to do that. Otherwise, we're going to put ourselves at a huge disadvantage when we when we argue these points internationally. Uh, so uh, we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to make sure that people don't do uh, silly things like. Uh, make agreements that we won't operate in certain areas. Uh, uh, we need to take a very strict uh, interpretation of this and, and not dilute it because it's going to be important to us in the future. Uh, the other pieces of this are slightly different, and these are the these are the claims, the territorial claims for you know, disputed islands and, and so on that you're all well aware of that that really have. You know mechanisms within the, you know, the international court and community to to resolve, and that's where they ought to be uh, resolved. Uh, but once again, uh, you know those uh, even once they're resolved, uh, they're still uh, uh, an inalienable right, so to speak, for uh, the free passage uh, to ensure that the trade um, you know can move where it needs to move, and that militaries. Uh, can operate, uh, you know, freely within uh, that convention. So I think uh, uh, you, you'll continue to see the Chinese push, as we've seen other people push, uh, and and we've got to kind of hitch up our britches and uh, and stand up to them. So one last one last brief question. Just about at the end of the time. Is there any? function for the United States Navy, potential at least, in a Libya, every significant portion of which is within five miles of the sea, other than just as a landing and a taking off field for aircraft? In the, you mean for the Navy? Yeah, for the Navy. Well, of course, the Navy, uh, the Navy was very much involved in the, in the opening, uh, uh, opening efforts of the establishment of the no-fly zone. They shot some 200 Tomahawk cruise missiles from submarines and surface ships that took out uh, a lot of their air defense sites, uh, some of their command and control facilities, uh, you know, the key elements uh, that would allow their Libyan military to threaten uh, their own people. Uh, so it was a significant effort, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, should you uh, should you uh, change the mission, uh, which I wouldn't advocate, uh, uh, then you know my guess is that uh, certainly amphibious forces would have a role um, in a future Libyan effort. But I I think right now we we've, we've got it about right. Uh, uh, we've we've established a no fly zone. Uh, we have interpreted it very liberally to mean not only planes but uh, but tanks and, and other military capability that threatens uh, uh, threatens the Libyan people uh, and as well as their command and control uh, locations throughout the country that uh, that operate uh, you know those significant forces. Fargo, I just I want to say thank you, uh, thank you for your years of service to our country, and thank you for being here today with your very insightful comments. Thank you.